last time, we um, <clears throat> talked about the general uh, um, system memory architecture. That is, we have um, hierarchy of caches inside the processor. Um, So um, we say that the L3 cache controller has um, at least three queues. Two of them are going towards the memory controller. Uh, one is um, a miss queue. Another one is a write back queue. Uh, so this one carries the requests that uh, miss in the L3 cache. And this one carries the requests, uh, this one carries the dirty edited cache box to be written back to main memory. And there is a queue coming in this direction where you get the responses to the pieces. Okay, so I'll call it a response queue. And there is an arbiter which uh, uh, schedules these three queues in according to some protocol. And whenever it picks up one of these two queues, it would pick up the head of the queue and put it in the memory controller scheme, all right? And memory controller's job is to schedule this queue, so pick up requests, decode them, meaning that it will look at the address, and it will look at the command, and depending on the address, it will figure out the bank number. So we'll today see how, um, how you decode that bank ID from address. And there are a bunch of queues, one, one for each bank of the DRAM, and we'll put the corresponding request into the corresponding queue. And the bank controller will schedule these requests according to some protocol. Okay. And it will send the request to the DRAM, and eventually the response will come back into this queue. Okay. And the response will be sent over to the bus, into the L3 caches response. Okay. If, it, if it's a write back uh, request, then of course there won't be any response. The, the data will just be written back to the corresponding bank. So is this um, overview clear to everybody, this particular architecture? All right, so today what we're going to do is, um, assuming this general architecture, we're going to open this up okay, and see what goes inside. So, um, so to start with, um, at a very high level, the DRAM is organized as rows and columns of bits. Okay. So there are a bunch of rows. So, so as, as we mentioned last time, the DRAM would have several banks. So we're looking at one bank. Right? We're just opening up one bank. So it will have a bunch of rows and it will have a bunch of columns. Now the way the DRAM organization is defined today, that uh, a column is not really a column of bits. It's usually multiple bits. So for example, this could be a typical column. Okay. It could contain several bits. All right. So, um, so this is the intersection of a row and a column. A column is not a single bit, remember. It is several bits. Now, how do we really read a particular um, a bank? Okay, so whenever a request goes, as I said, the memory controller will figure out the bank ID and put the request in the corresponding bank request queue. Okay. The first command that will go from the bank request queue to the DRAM bank is, a, is called a row address row or a RAS operation. Okay. So what does it do? It essentially activates the corresponding row okay, with the data, where the data box. All right. So again, the row number can be decoded from the given address. So we'll talk about that today also. Okay. So essentially what you do is in the, when you activate a row, you read out this entire row into a row buffer. Okay. Each bank gets a row buffer. All right. 
So you read this entire row into a row buffer. So, um, and then the next operation that happens is called a column address stroke, where you send a column address. That tells you which column would contain the requested data. Okay. And essentially the job of the DRAM is that, take that column address and take out those bits out of the corresponding row. Right? And now, within this particular column, you may not actually require all the bits. So there is a column offset also that, that's decoded from the address. So certain bits may be needed from this column. Okay. And finally, those bits go out from this particular back. So that's how you read the data. Now, one thing to observe here is that the content of the row buffer survives until you get a request to a different row. Okay. Which means if this bank request scheduler is hard enough, it would actually cluster all the requests going to the same row together. It would send them one after another. That would save your RAS operation. You can actually do a RAS followed by a, a sequence of caches satisfying all the requests. So, so that's that's a very common scheduling technique used in all DRAMs today, um, where the bank bank uh, request scheduler prioritizes the requests that go to the same row of the bank. Now what happens when you get a, so eventually, of course, it will happen that um, you don't have any request in the bank request queue that fall on the same row as the currently open row. So this is not an open, currently open row. Okay, all right. So then what do you do? Of course, you have to, you have to, you know, take the extra latency. Okay, so now there are three things that happen. So that call, that's called a pre-charge operation. So RAS was essentially, we said, it's an activate, activate operation, and then you wait for a certain number of cycles before you can send a cache. Okay, that's called a row to column access delay. Row to column access delay. All right. So first thing you do is you, so you're talking about a case where currently open row is X. And the bank controller has scheduled a request to row one. Right. So clearly, your row buffer does not contain the desired data and closes this particular row. Okay. All right. Then you do the same thing. You activate row Y, the new row, which reads the row out into the row buffer. And then you wait for this amount of time, row to column access zero. And then you issue the column access row. Okay. So the first one that is and a particular request mapping to the current open row is called a row hit, which has a latency equal to T cas. Just time to do a column access row. All right. The second scenario where a currently requested row is not open is called a row conflict. And it has a latency equal to T precharge. Sometimes it's called TRP, that is row precharge, plus TRCD, that is row to column access delay, plus T CAS. Okay? That's a row conflict. Okay? So you can now clearly see that um, row conflict time is going to be much higher than your row heat time. So naturally, a smart scheduling technique would be to walk this particular bank request queue and cluster all the requests going to the same row ID. Right? Send them one after another. Right? So then for the whole cluster, you will do this only once and we'll do TCAS for the subsequent requests. So there is no separate time in the conflict for activating the No, there is no separate time. Activate is just a command. However, the row buffer is not stable until this much of time. You have to wait for this much. Is it clear everybody? Now there is a third thing that's called, you might be wondering why didn't I use row miss and row hit. Okay. So there's a third thing which is called row miss. So this is slightly different from row conflict. So in case of row miss, what happens is that there is no open row currently. Right? So essentially what you do is you don't do any pre-charge. Okay. All you do is you do an activate and a cast.
Now you might wonder why should this at all happen ever? Because I always have an open door, right? Which corresponds to the last open, last uh, executed request. At the starting only, right? However, um, there are certain uh, DRAM controllers which follow something called a closed page policy, which basically says that if the DRAM controller can infer that this row will not be needed in future, you can actually close it early, okay. so that you can hide this particular latency when the next request shows up. The pre-charge time is not in the critical path anymore. Okay. So, sir, for reading, you need to pre-charge? Sorry? For, uh, are pre-charge times included in RAS? Which one? No. What, what I say is when you read data into row buffer, no. you need not to pre-charge. No. No. You activate the row, which means you read the row out of. Okay, so um, so that's called a closed page policy. So an extreme of closed page policy would be that after every request, you close them. Okay, all right. So which is of course not going to be very good if you have locality in the access tree. So essentially then what will happen is that every request will, will take this much of time. No okay. right. And the other one is called open page policy, where you keep the um, row open until you run into a conflict. So in that case, what will happen is that you will, first time you take a row miss, but otherwise you'll either have row hit or row conflict. And this, this particular policy is exercised by the memory controller. So the memory controller designer will figure out what to do. So if, if the designer can uh, design a good prediction policy for closing the row buffer, um, you can actually use a closed page policy. So by the way, uh, I'm using a, the, the word page here because often this is also called um, a page buffer, okay, or DRAM page, this particular one. Don't get confused with your waste page. It has nothing to do with the waste page. It's totally different. Right. So is this clear to everybody? How I access the DRAM and what actually matters when I access the DRAM? Okay, what scheduling decisions would actually influence my, um, my DRAM latency? Okay, so these are very simple overview. There are many other time parameters that you have to take care of. For example, he asked whether there is a time required for activating a row. Okay, right? So and, and there are many other time parameters. But this is what is a, is a first order effect okay, of accessing a DRAM. For example, there are other second order effects like when you write to a DRAM bank, that is you write to the row buffer, how much time must lapse before you can read the row buffer again? Okay. There are certain constraints on that. Okay. You cannot immediately read that row buffer. Okay. Right. So um, if you're interested, I can send you a link. You can read about uh, uh, DRAM vendors' data sheets. You can see uh, many more details. Okay. Um, if you, I don't know if you have ever uh, tried to explore DRAMs, but if you do, um, you find that DRAM latency is normally mentioned as something like um, 10, 10, 10, three numbers appear usually, right? So those are these three numbers. So this is what you actually uh, mentioned, right? Okay, all right. So what I'll do is, um, I'll walk you through uh, one example where um, uh, I'll take a typical uh, DRAM um, and actually look at how the addresses are decoded into bank, rows, columns, etc., etc. Okay, all right. Um, oh, so this is one thing that I can show you in this course. Unfortunately, other things are all inside the chip, so I could not. I'm sorry, I brought these uh, deal cards. So um, I don't know if you have seen these things, the way cards. So this is what they look like. Okay. So you'll see these, these black chips, right? These are DRAM chips. And they normally appear on both sides. Okay. Um, they can appear on, a, on only one side also. Okay. So this one has, this has, this has four chips on this side, four here. There are eight chips. So these are DDR2 uh, 512 megabyte memory card. Okay. And these are the pin connectors. You can see these copper uh, wearings in the bottom. Right. And this one is a DDR connector. Okay. This, this is a DDR DRAM. Not DDR2. Okay. Right. Uh, same capacity, but the layout is different. So one way to figure out whether it is DDR2 or DDR is that if you align the a DDR card with a DDR2 card, okay. Let me see if I can show it to you. You find that these two notches 
here are not aligned actually. Okay. So the, the, the DDR2 notch will appear early, the, the DDR, uh, DDR notch. So upper one is a DDR notch, the lower one is a DDR2 notch. So anyway, so you can read about exact layout of DDR2 and DDR, why they don't align and etc. etc. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to talk about one such card. Uh, what exactly it means. So you can see that nine, car, nine chips are on this side, nine on this side, okay. There are 18 chips, okay. Out of which actually 16 are data chips, two are error correcting chips. Okay. So, so let's try to see what, what actually goes inside this, okay. So um, this particular write-up is also posted on the course website, so you can read about that. Okay. Uh, this is just a summary of one uh, particular DRAM from Micron. So what we'll do is uh, we'll look at one, um, so this is called a dual inline uh, memory module, this one, okay. uh, both of these, dual inline memory module or DIM. These are called DIM cards. Um, there used to be a single inline memory module, a SIM card, long back in the 90s. Okay. Um, they had less number of pins, but today you won't be able to buy a SIM card, they're not in the market. All you get is a DIM card. Okay. All right. um, and, and remember that it has nothing to do with whether the chips appear on one side or both sides. Okay. That has nothing to do with SIM or DIM. So we are going to look at uh, one 4GB um, ECC DIM with 2 gigabit X8 DRAM chips. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to explain what this quotation means. Okay. So this one stands for ECC. Does anybody know? Sorry? Error correcting code. Error correcting code, exactly. So each DRAM chip is 2 gigabit in size. Okay, all right. So how many chips do I need to cover 4 gigabit? Gigabyte? 16. 16, right? This is four gigabyte, this is two gigabits, okay, all right? So normally, uh, whenever you see a DRAM chip capacity, they're normally mentioned in bits, okay, how many bits it is, all right? So there are 16 chips, okay? But this DIM card would actually have 18 chips, two of which are ECC chips. So uh, what is the ECC density? How many ECC bits per byte of data? Yeah. How many is? One bit per byte. Sorry, one? One bit per byte, exactly. So usually, the simplest ECC protocol is that you store the XOR of all the eight bits okay. uh, in a single bit, right? So why, why, why is XOR? So if parity changes. Right, exactly. If one bit flips, then I should be able to catch it. All right, so um, we have 18 chips, two of which are ECC chips, so 16 are data chips, okay. All right, so um, each side of the card has nine chips. There will be some small control chips also on the, on the counter card, but we are ignoring them. And this X8 here means that each DRAM chip can provide eight bits of output. Whenever you send a particular command to the DRAM chip, it can either write or read eight bits. All right. So um, usually, these DIMMs have a 64-bit interface. Sorry. 64-bit interface with a memory controller. Okay, all right. So um, how many chips do I need to fill up 64 bits? Each chip can provide eight bits, right? Eight chips, right? So whenever a request goes, normally I will activate eight DRAM chips out of sixteen. Okay. Of course, um, one ECC chip will also be activated. Okay. All right. And then what will happen is that these eight chips will give me total of sixty-four bits of data. Okay. So let's see how it actually does that. Um, each side of the chip. forms a rank, 
the inside of the card. So in this case, so uh, this is just an accident that one side of the card forms a rank. Um, in general, a rank means that a subset of DRAM chips that participate in generating a data packet. Right? So in this particular case, it happens that you need eight DRAM chips to generate a data packet, which is on one side of the card. Right? However, you can you can easily come up with uh, with a different uh, you know uh, DIM architecture where you can find that only half of one side will be one rank. Okay, so um, uh, sorry. So this one is actually 72-bit interface, uh, which is 64-bit data plus 8-bit ECC. Okay. All right. So. Uh, So we have two ranks here, each side is a rank. Now, let's see. Right here. Okay, so now the memory controller, when it receives a request from this side, it will receive a request for a cache block, <coughs> either for reading or writing. Now, let's assume that we have a cache block size of 128 bytes. Now, we get 64-bit data in one request from the DRAM, right? So how many, how many, uh, how many bus transactions I need here? 16, right? And we got 16 such transactions to fill up one cache block, okay? Um, so this is often called the burst length of the DRAM. So burst length is configured when you boot the memory controller. In this case, it's going to be 16. Okay. Now, um, definitely, what we really want is that um, the first request, that is the first eight byte request for the cache block, uh, may have a, a row conflict or a row miss, depending on the protocol. But the, the remaining 15 transactions should be row hits. That's what I would expect. Okay, and that's how we must. Um, we must put our row and column IDs in the address, okay, so that a cache block would have 15 row hits and maybe at least, I mean at most one uh, row hits of complete. Okay, all 16 could be row hits of Okay. So, uh, let's see. And this one is called a channel that we discussed last time. Um, and you can have multi-channel memory controllers as well. Okay, uh, that's also possible. So in this case, what will happen is that you connect one DIM to one channel and another DIM to another channel. All right. So there will be two separate DIMs connected to two channels. Okay, and that will give you better aggregate bandwidth. And let's assume that uh, each DRAM chip. be A to a band internally. Okay, all right. So and each band looks like this. It has a bunch of rows, a bunch of columns. All right. So that means when I want to access a piece of data, what I need is, for this particular one, I need to tell the row ID. So first of all, I need to choose my bank ID. Okay. Within the bank, I need to tell the row ID. I tell the column ID, and also I tell the column offset. That is, from where these eight bits should come within the column, because one column may not be eight bits; it may be longer than that. Okay. So, um, for this particular uh, two GB, uh, two gigabit DRAM chip, let's assume that we have um, number of rows equal to thirty-two K, which is two to the power of fifteen number of columns equal to 128 
and column width. is 64 bits okay so that uniquely defines my bank organization what the bank looks like okay so how big is the row buffer So you have one kilobyte row buffer per bank. Okay. okay, all right. So let's see how the address is reported. So this is my physical address. Right. Now, whenever memory controller sends a request to the DRAM, it aligns it to A5 boundary. Why is that? Because the interface is of 64 bit data. It always talks in terms of 64 bit chunks. Okay. So it aligns it to A5 boundary, which means the last three bits are zero. Okay? So any physical address that the DRAM sees will have last three bits equal to zero. So which which means it can be ignored. All right, so after that comes um, the column offset, which tells me within a column, which bits should be these eight bits. So how many bits do I need for column offset? Column width is 64 bits. Why three bits? Exactly. So I, I have eight possibilities of getting eight bits output out from the 64 bit column. Okay. So this is three bits, column offset. Then comes the column ID, which is seven bits. Okay, then, then the bank. The bank ID which is three bits, then comes the rank, which is one bit, and we need 15 bits for the row. How much does it come to? 32 bits, right? And that's what you'd expect. To access a full game by team, you need 32 bits of bank. Okay, so when the, when the memory controller gets the particular physical address, its job is to do this. It partitions the address into these this, uh, this different uh, fields, removes the last three bits, and tells the DRAM about the following things, the column offset, the column ID, and the row ID. Okay. And it sends these three things to the corresponding rank to the corresponding bank. Okay. And the request gets broadcast to all the chips in that rank, um, that would actually provide the data. So eight chips would now work concurrently, and within these chips, each each of these chips will actually operate on this particular bank, and would access this particular row, this particular column, and within the column, this particular offset. Okay. And each chip will provide you eight bits, and finally you get out 64 bits of data and eight bits of parity. Okay. And then you communicate that over the channel to the memory controller, and then the bus length is set to 16, which means that DRAM will now, every cycle, will keep on providing one such packet, okay, until the bus length is exhausted. At which point, the request completes. In case of write, of course, um, there, there won't be any communication with memory controller. The write will happen one after another, the, the chunks of eight bytes. Okay, is it clear? So each transfer is called a transaction. It's usually called a parse. Yeah. That's that's the no which transfer, transfer within a burst. Eight byte. Yeah, yeah that's a parse. Yeah. You need sixteen bars to get a cache. Any question for this? Clear? 
Now, there are a couple of things that you have to resolve. If I have a multi-channel memory controller, where should I put my channel list? In address. So, in other words, given an address, I must be able to figure out on which channel to send this particular request. And each channel has a game connected to it. So, where should I put my channel, channel list? What makes most sense? Yeah? On this side? Here? Why? What's the reason? We are ignoring the last three bits. That's okay. That's because the address is aligned. Yes. Yeah. So imagine that I have a dual channel memory controller, right? What's the purpose of having dual channel? So that I can make both the channels, I can utilize both the channels concurrently. Right? What makes me do that? So what, what will what will enable both the channels to be used concurrently? How should I put the channel list? What is the chain of a request? We will schedule the request so that both channels are used. That's right, yes, yes. Actually, the first bit is previous message. First bit? First bit of this single address. Why do you say so? I want two independent requests to go to two channels, right? So that they can work independently. What is the grain of a request that memory controller sees? Bytes. Sorry? Bytes. Cash block size, right? I've, I've, I've sent one cash block to this channel, the next one to that channel, right? So I've just ordered it, the cash blocks, between the channels. So I put it right after the, so in this case I have a 120 byte cash block, so I put the seventh bit here. This would be my channel. Okay. The column ID will get split, unfortunately, in this case, right? Um, okay, so, so you have to be, so, so this is one, one, Probably the, the most useful way of putting the channels. So, you, so that you can alternate between cash blocks. So why are the lower bits uh, oh, towards the extreme left? Yeah, I'll get there. Yes, I'm coming to that. Why, why this is done in this way? Yeah. Uh, just one more question before we get there. Um, what if I have multiple multi channel memory controllers? So then I have to select the memory controller as well. Why should I put that? Does it make sense to switch alternate cache blocks to memory controllers? No, because you have multiple multi channels. Fine. So within each memory controller, I'll alternate between channels. Mm -hmm. right. that, that makes sense. Right. Why do we put the row ID on the most significant side? Can anybody explain why? Think about this latencies. Does it maximize the amount of continuous data in a row if I put the row ID on the most significant side? Yes, it, it does, right? Yes. So which means if I have sequential access, I would have, mostly I'll have row hits, except the first access. Yes. Okay. But when you introduce channel ID there, yes. you don't just split uh, Yes, I do, yes, yes, I do break the locality. But if you still look, look inside a channel, within a channel, it's still continuous. Yes, overall I'm still I'm breaking the locality, but within a channel it's continuous. So would you want the channel ID to be the least significant after the three and significant ones? So that channel keeps changing? No, th there is a there's a technical problem in doing that. Um, then essentially you are switching bits across channels. Which, which cannot be done. 
So the column offset cannot be split across channels. That's not possible. Column offset can No, essentially what you're saying is that why don't you split one request across channels? That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. So I'm saying that no. Why wouldn't you have give independent requests to channels so that they can proceed independently? Because what we now the problem of what you're proposing is that now you have to wait for both the channels to complete before responding to the processor. But with two independent channels given to two cache logs, they may be responded out of order actually. As soon as one completes, I can respond to the processor. Yeah, I think that's about it. Yeah, so the latency parameters I've just mentioned, so uh, uh, they are specified like uh, TCAS, TRCD, TRP. So th that's the three numbers. You often find a port number, which is TRAS, the time taken for a RAS operation. So that's how the DRAM sheets normally specify the latency parameters. Um, otherwise, you normally talk about DRAMs either like, so DIMMs are normally talked about like this. The DRAM chips would be like this. Also, along with this, there will be a DDR specification and a frequency parameter. Okay, so normally, so they may, be like, they may look like this. DDR3, 1333, okay. So what this means is that is a third generation double data rate uh, DRAM. And the effective frequency is 1333 megahertz. By effective frequency, what I mean is that, so a double data rate DRAM can transfer data on both the clock edges. Okay. Which means in this case, if it is a DDR DRAM, it will transfer 64 bits on both the clock edges. Okay. So which means to have 16 bars, you would actually require eight cycles. Eight cycles. Okay. The question is what is the frequency of these cycles? What is the cycle time? This one is not the, not the actual frequency. Half of this is the actual frequency. This is the effective frequency. At this frequency, you require 16 cycles. Okay, all right. Okay, half the frequency will require 8 cycles. All right. So keep that in mind. Um, so that's pretty much about it uh, that you need to know if you want to really uh, make an educated decision about buying a deal card. Okay. I, I don't think you need to know anything else. So that the, the marketing people cannot pull you. Um, okay, so um, let's see if I have anything else here. Yeah, that's about. So this is about DRAM. Uh, so we're talking about the main memory, right? Um, and you might notice that. So one obvious question that one could ask is, why do you separate the RAS and CAS operations? Why do you send the row address and column address together? That would definitely save a lot of time because I could actually combine many many commands together and uh, probably give out your data much earlier. Okay. Because here, what I'm doing is that I first activate the row, then I you know read the row out, and then I activate my column. Right. So instead, if I had the row address and column address, I could probably read out only this much, and it could give you the data much faster. Okay. Any idea why the why these are separate into two pages, RAS and CAS? What could be the reason for doing this? So normally these, uh, the row address and the column address, so um, so as I said, you know, uh, when I mentioned that, I said that the, the, the memory controller sends the row ID, column ID, and the column accept, offset to the DRAM band controller. They actually do not get sent together. Okay. First you would send the row ID, and then you would actually communicate the column ID and the column offset on the same address bus. So you multiplex both things. One Why is that? What is the reason? Why? So under what circumstances you normally think about multiplexing? When you want to make a selection of Sorry? When you want to make a selection No, no, here, no, no. So here we are talking, not talking about multiplexer. We are, we are talking about multiplexing two things on a single physical resource, that is address bus. Right? You first send a row address, and then you send a column address. Why do you, why do you need to do this? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. When you're short of wires, right? Then I don't, do not have enough wires to communicate the row and column address in parallel. Okay. So the point is that um, the DRAM chips have pin limited. They are very much pin limited. 
Um, and the reason is that, of course, the obvious question is why? I mean, why can't you increase the number of pins? What, uh, what uh, uh, hurts um, increasing number of pins? So the reason is that that hurts the density. In DRAM, the density is extremely important. You know, how many bits you can pack in unique area? That is the factor when you design the DRAM. So when you have more pins, you normally have more peripheral circuitry, and that hurts the density of the DRAM. Okay. Um, so here, we, are, we never mention the area, actually. But that is a very important factor. How much area do you need to pack this 2 gigabit uh, you know, of data? Right? So that's why normally uh, the DRAM chips are pin limited. And which is why you multiplex the web column address on the same address bus one after another. Okay. Um, this one is called a sense amplifier. It has a technical name. Um, if you want to read up on that, I can give you some references. Um, so, um, an array of sense amplifiers actually hold the data. That's the whole number. And, and uh, it involves a lot of electrical engineering, how to design good sensor set of requires. Refresh mechanism I've already talked about. So periodically, the, the memory controller will be scheduling refresh cycles. Okay. So um, in a refresh cycle, what you normally do is, um, so first of all, the first thing that happens is um, that the bank which is currently being refreshed cannot be accessed by the processor at the time. Okay. So, the, so that's, that's, the, that's the performance impact of refresh cycle. So during refreshing, what you do is you first close this row, whichever, whichever is open in this bank. And then read out each row at a time, one after another. Read out the row, write it back. That's all. That's what the refresh does. Just read one row at a time. So that refreshes the contents of the row. So that's the refresh cycle. But remember that here you have these 32K rows. You have to refresh all of them. That takes a lot of time. Which is why DRAM refresh is, is really an expensive operation. And it's normally not done very frequently. Um, every DRAM data sheet comes with the, the, the nominal time that the DRAM can operate without a refresh. So the memory controller designer has to schedule the refresh operation within that nominal time so that the data is not lost. All right, so uh, one more small thing that I want to mention. I want to open this up a little bit more. Okay, just show you what goes inside. Okay. So I'll show you two rows of the DRAM. Okay. Um, just to show you how it works. Okay, so these are um, four bit rows that I'm showing. I'm showing two rows of the DRAM. Okay. Um, this is the DRAM cell which stores the bit. Okay. All right. And this is a switch, All right. which closes whenever I give a high voltage here on this particular wire. All right. Whenever I give a high voltage here, this closes. And whatever the value of this here will appear on this particular wire. Okay. All right. So here I'm showing uh, two different rows. Um, this is called a word line. And this one often called a, called a word. This is called a bit line. 
Okay, now suppose <coughs> I want to access this particular row. Okay. So what do I need to do? I apply a high voltage on this water line. Okay. And then I read out these four bits, four four bit lines. Okay. So I get the value in the in that particular row. Yeah, as simple as that. Now of course uh, a lot of engineering goes inside this. How to design this particular bit? Okay, all right. How to maintain this? And and there are many DRAM architectures. Like for example, there are um, DRAM cells of only one transistor that hold the bit in a single capacitor. Actually, implemented is here one transistor. Okay, now suppose I want to change this, this two row DRAM, so that I can access both the rows simultaneously. How do I, how do, I do this? Currently, it's not possible. Try, try to appreciate that. If I enable both the word lines, the two rows will get jumbled up. Actually, okay. I'll not get any any good data. So how do I enable this? If I want to access both the rows, what changes do I need to make? Shift the below four besides these four. Sorry, say again. Shift the below four cells to beside. No, that has not changed. There are two rows. <laughs> So since I cannot access both the rows here, this is called a single ported RAM. Okay. It's a single ported RAM. I can only access one of the rows. And you can see that I can add more rows just in the same way. Okay. Now how do I do how do I make it dual ported? So that I can access two rows. <coughs> Just more bit lines, that's enough? No, sir. And switches to connect to both bit lines. 24 word lines? Yes. Yeah, so I add one more word line. Per row. I add one more bit line. Per column. And I add one more switch. Etc. All right. Now it's clear, right? I can now enable this row. Right, etc. And so on. So I can not only access the same row twice. I can access these two rows also simultaneously. Okay. So these are dual ported RAM. What penalty have I paid for making it dual ported? Sorry? Too many wires. Anything else? Anything in terms of latency? I tell you that it will be slower than a single port. Why? <coughs> Sorry? The answer is slow. Well, you tell me exactly why it is slower. <laughs> So compared to the single ported RAM, is it true that the word line length increases? Yeah. The length of the word line spanning one row does increase? Yes. It does, right? Because yes. there have to be some gap between the bit lines, right? So this width increases. Does the length of the bit line increase? It does, right? Yes. So um, and the time to charge is proportional to the length of the line, is RCD length. So as you add more ports, it's going to get slower and slower, the RAM structure. Okay, and this is the reason why. Right? Okay, I think uh, I'm going to stop here. Okay, so one more thing. So these are called access transistors, uh, these things. And often taken together, this whole whole blob here is called an access stack. Okay, so 
you need a bigger access stack if you have more ports. And that's what the implication is. All right. Okay, so that's pretty much it about DRAM. Um, so next time, I'll take a look at uh, the SRAM a little bit, which is a static random access memory, which is used for caches. Very similar. Um, just a few extra points that need to be touched upon. Um, and then we'll uh, uh, move on to something else. But that's after the break, of course. Okay. So what is the dynamic thing here? This particular implementation of this particular bit. Now it is implemented using one capacitance. Okay. All right. Just one capacitance, which leaks away. In static RAM, this bit is normally implemented as cross coupled inverters, which you have learned in your digital uh, electronics course. If you cross coupled inverters, that acts as a latch, right? Which holds the bit. So there is a question of leaking out. So, so if we increase uh, the length of word line, yes. and decrease the number of uh, length of bit line, yeah. so we improve on uh, latency. You so increase. Yes, increase. I mean, it slows down. There are more. I mean, row sizes uh, more, and we uh, uh, decrease number of rows. We increase number. Sorry? We increase width of each row, yeah. and we decrease number of rows. So you make the make the RAM wider. That's what you're saying. It depends how wide the RAM is. Because see, the uh, recharge latency is to recharge the bit line, but you also have to count the time to charge the word line. Because until that stabilizes, the access transistors cannot be activated. The switch cannot act properly, right? So if this, this all, both of these are the critical part. Yeah, it may be true that you may reach a sweet point where the total latency becomes weaker. 